Welcome back to our walk through the Bible. We are in the book of Judges. Uh, I really liked Joshua. Joshua is one of those positive books of, of if you're following God, he's going to bring success and prosperity. It's a, it's a book that the old televangelists used to use all the time. It is a very positive-minded document. And then there's Judges. And if Joshua is one of the most positive, Judges is one of the most negative. It is a disappointing book as we see God's people turn away from him to serve the Baals. Uh, we're just wishing we could skip Judges. There were so many warnings from Joshua, from Moses, from God himself that you can't do that and expect to continue to receive his blessings. In fact, one of those places where those warnings are given is in Joshua chapter 23 and Joshua's farewell address. Of all the things that he could say, it was these warnings of the safeguard of obedience. Verse 6, for instance, in Joshua 23, Be firm to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. That's some of that same language that we saw in chapter 1, to, to don't go left or right, to, to be careful to completely obey God's word, and that would be a safeguard. But another safeguard that they overlooked was that of separation from the peoples in the land of Canaan. That's also in Joshua 23, verses 7 and 8, where Joshua said, Do not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. You are to cling to the Lord your God. So don't compromise in that regard. That would be a safeguard for uh, continuing in God's blessings. And then another a safeguard would be that of introspection. Also there in Joshua 23 in verse 11, take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. It reminds us that when everything's summed up with obedience, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you truly love him, then you'll be careful to do what is found in his word. Even Jesus said that. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So it's not like it was mentioned once and then moved away from. Moses mentions it in Deuteronomy. Joshua is mentioning it. And yet we come to Judges and we find people forgetting it, a new generation that is forgetting it. Well, what was the problem? If you go to Judges chapter 1, beginning in verse 27 through the end of the chapter, we see a major problem that just sets the stage for the rest of Judges is that they didn't completely drive the people out of the land. God has said, I'm giving you victory. I'm giving you the land. You just go in there and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work through you. One of your men will put to fight a thousand. But they didn't. They didn't drive out. So there's eight incomplete conquests that are mentioned in that section of Judges 1, 27 through 36. Another problem is found in chapter 2 of Judges in verses 1 through 3, and that is that they made covenants with these people. God said, I'll never break my covenant with you, verse 1. But then in verse 2, he says, You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this that you have done? And then he gives them the consequences for that. They had made agreements, made covenants with these people that they were supposed to drive out. And then in chapter 3, in verses 5 and 6, we find out that among these people, and, and they're listed there in verse 5, the Canaanites, the Hittites, all these people that we've talked about before in the book of, of Joshua, they're allowing them to stay in the land. And, verse 6, they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods and did evil in the sight of the Lord through that intermarriage. The problem with the intermarriage had nothing to do with, with race or the color of their skin, but it had to do with if they intermarried with these people, then their hearts would be turned toward their gods. And that's what verse 7 says. After they did this, they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. They were, in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, unequally yoked spiritually. And whenever you see uh, intermarriage brought up in the Old Testament. That's really what it's about, is the potential of their hearts being turned away from God, and that takes place numerous times, even with Solomon himself. So we have this moral failure that has come about that, that started with apathy, and then with tolerance, and then with compromise. 
And isn't that true as well today? You know, a spiritually strong person doesn't become weak overnight. It's just little by little. A little bit of apathy, and then it moves into tolerance of things that we know God has commanded us not to do, and then it moves into compromise, and then there is personal and community chaos. And that's where we are in Judges, with such despicable things happening, enslavement and poverty, and all kinds of horrible uh, things taking place in the community because they had turned away from God. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So uh, we see a cycle then that happens with this chaos, a uh, four-point cycle. The first part being, of course, their sin. And Judges chapter 2 uh, tells us, beginning in verse 11, uh, that it's, it's not that they made some little mistakes. They turned, verse 11, and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of the fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. Remember when we were talking about the, the Exodus, how that was the great redemptive event that they were to reflect upon. God's great act of mercy in bringing them out of Egypt. He's the God that did that, and they forgot about him and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them. They forsook the Lord and served the Baal and the Ashtaroth, and the anger of the Lord burned against them. So the first part of that cycle is their sin, which, by the way, in the uh, 28th chapter of, of Deuteronomy, we talked about the Deuteronomic theology, uh, the doctrine of retribution. There was this warning that if you turn away from God, that his uh, anger is going to burn against you, and specifically that he is going to bring curses upon you. That's in Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. If you will not obey the Lord to observe his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, all these curses shall come upon you and will overtake you. His anger is going to come against you. Again, in Joshua, we like the idea of, of God being for us. We like the passage in Romans 8, 31, if God's for us, who can be against us? But it's, it's really a terrifying thought to think of his anger being against us, and then in the book of Joshua, actually bringing other people to punish his people. But that's what happens because of this first part of the four-point cycle, there's sin. And after sin comes the suffering. Again, this isn't some surprise. Joshua had said in Joshua 24, in verse 20, that if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you. I, I just soon close that page and not even think about that idea that God's going to turn against his people, that he's going to consume them. And for some people, that's a great turnoff to God. How can he be so angry? But we've got to keep it all in context of his righteousness, of the warnings that he gave, and not forget that there's two other parts to this cycle. The third part is when they are suffering, when they're enslaved, when these horrible things are happening, they cry out to the Lord. So you have the sin, then you have the suffering, then you have the supplication. They're crying out to the Lord, saying, Lord, we are so sorry. Uh, we realize now our backs are against the wall. I think about, for my generation, 9-11, and how the churches were full and, and people were praying, and, you know, we haven't, haven't seen that so much since then, but, but people were, were realizing we need the Lord to, to save us. And that's the fourth part uh, of this cycle, is salvation. When God is moved to pity. Back in Judges chapter 2 and verse 16, after these prayers, then the Lord raised up judges. He raised up judges who delivered them from the hands. And uh, if you jump down to verse 18, it says that he does that because he was moved to pity. So even in his anger, even as they rejected him, even as they committed spiritual adultery, God's heart was moved to pity, and he'd raise up these judges to deliver them from uh, their oppressors. So a little small outline then, a little three-point outline of judges as we have this prologue in chapters 1 and 2 that's telling us uh, how we got to this point, uh, not only the incomplete conquest and the agreements and, and the generation that's turning away that we're going to talk about a little bit more here in just uh, a few moments with our guest, Tony Hill. And then chapters 3 through 16 are the stories of deliverance. 
where we have the, the 12 judges, or 13 if you want to count uh, Barak, who, who told Deborah, I'll go if you, if you go with me. <laughs> so usually we just think of 12 judges. But one of my favorite is Gideon. I, I just love the idea that when the angel comes to him and, and says, you are a valiant warrior, God is with you, that his first response is, it just doesn't seem that way. You know, the, the Midianites are destroying the crops, they're destroying the animals. He's indoors trying to thresh wheat in the wine press, and it, it, he's just being honest. And God can handle that. You know what? We're going we're gonna to see that throughout our study, that when there's an authentic relationship, uh, when, when we're looking at real people as we are in Scripture, there is that questioning at times, and God can handle that. And so uh, over in... Uh, 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 with him in chapter 6 where he says in verse 13 if the Lord is with me why is all this happening then he adds again a reference to the exodus where are his miracles which our fathers told us about saying did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt another connecting point with the exodus and then he says it feels like the Lord has abandoned us well, of course, the Lord's going to work powerfully through him. Remember on Gideon that his first assignment was to go and tear down his father's altars. So it tells you a little bit about the generation ahead of him and how their hearts had been turned away from the Lord. He does that, and of course, that causes uh, a lot of problems. So remember in the book of Judges that one person can make a difference. That's the story with these judges. God is raising them up. And that ought to be our prayer today, that God will raise up the next generation of leaders, the next generation that's going to turn people's hearts to the Lord, not only leaders in the church and, and teachers and parents and, 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 and mentors and all of that, but also in our, in our communities, that God would raise up those that would turn their heart toward him and lead us in, uh, in moral, good moral ways. So... Uh, Let's pray that. Let's pray for God to, to raise up people. Another lesson from the book of Judges that we need to remember is God's mercy. And I, I just want us to focus on that because if you've read through Judges in preparation for tonight, you know, there's just a lot of disgusting things in there. But remember that he was moved to pity. And he still is today. Sometimes we, you know, we look at passages in the New Testament which speak about the, the, the terrifying aspect of falling into the, the Lord's hands unprepared on Judgment Day. We'll read about his wrath and his severity, but his greatest act of mercy is in Jesus Christ. The greatest demonstration of his pity upon us, realizing that we are our weak flesh, is in sending Jesus. Paul wrote in Titus chapter 3, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, his pity, his love, his compassion, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So for us today, as we read all these stories, we just need to be praising God for Christ, for the mercy that he's showing us, the one who saves us as we turn to him and realize the consequences for our sin how they have enslaved us. The way of the transgressor is hard. I mean, this story is played out in our lives individually as well. We've got to recognize the consequences of sin. Cry out to him and, of course, obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can enter into a saving, merciful relationship with him. So let's, uh, let's conclude this part of our study of Judges with uh, uh, that statement that's found at the end uh, it's also, it's in chapter 21, verse 25, but it's also found in chapter 17 and verse 6, where it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And it reminds us that, uh, that Gideon had said, The Lord will rule over you. It was God's desire to be their king. And later on when we get to 1 Samuel and people are clamoring for a king, uh, God will tell Samuel, well, what? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give them a king, but he'll say in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 7, they rejected me from being king over them. And you think about today, we have rulers, uh, we, we have leaders, but let's make 
God our King. Keep Him King. Keep Him seated on the throne. And that'll be a safeguard for each of us. And it's a great lesson to learn from the book of Judges. So thank you for joining us. Next time we'll be in the book of Ruth. We're joined now by one of our shepherds here at Sylvan Hills, Tony Hill. Tony, thank you. Hey, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. It's good to have you with us. We want to think a little bit about uh, Judges chapter 2 and this generation that verse 10 says uh, came along after Joshua died, after the older men that had uh, mm -hmm. been a part of that generation, after they died, then there comes this other generation that it says did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. It's just really shocking, isn't it? Yeah, it is. When I was looking back through that, I made a note. I was like, how did that happen? Mm. What happened? You know, we want to kind of, you know, think about what happened there. Was it the parents? Was it the kids? Was it, you know, what happened there that that generation did not get the stories, did not understand the stories? Mm. I don't know, you know. Yeah, I think it's, uh, at least for me personally, it's been easy to jump to the conclusion that the parents didn't do their job. Yeah that they didn't do what Deuteronomy yeah. 6 had told them to do and, and writing it on the doorpost and continuing to teach that generation. So there might have been some of that. Yeah, possibly it could be that when they came into this new land, the kids were distracted. Yeah. You know, the young people were distracted. They had all these new things to look at, a new land, new people, different people, and other things just distracted them from what their parents were trying to tell them is important. Wow. How often does that happen today? Yeah, that, that's wow. a lot of applications <laughs> yeah. to today of uh, if we think about bringing up our children in the discipline and instruction yeah, of the absolutely. Lord. Yeah. Um, and yet they have so many outside influences yeah. that are coming their way. So many, so many voices. It seems like hear. today it's more than it was when you and I were growing up. I mean, we're kind of contemporaries age wise. And, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about it. we spent a lot of time growing up talking on the phone. You know, it was not the you know, the social media or, you know, TikTok, Twitter, whatever it is this week. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked to people and we had those one-on-one -on -one relationships. And um, our, our kids are growing up in a really different world. And, it, you know, as a parent, it bothers me. It, mm -hmm. it really concerns me as I see, you know, Rebecca and her friends and the influence that that has on their, even, you know, their psyche, mental health and just mm -hmm. their sense of person. Yeah. You know. It's, it's really, you know, as a, as a parent, you do. You, we pray about that. Robin and I pray about that all the time, that, you know, they will not let this influence them. Right. And fortunately, I hear Rebecca and her friends talking about, I'm just going to turn it off. I'm going to take a fast from social media. I'm just going to yeah. take a break. i got to get away. And, you know, I'm grateful that a lot of our kids have that, yeah. um, that thought process, you know. Yeah, because before you know it, there's just so much concern about what other people think. Absolutely. You, know, you post yeah. something or you say something and then yeah. you get these responses. And, you know, we, again, with our generation, it was a much smaller circle that we were oh, yeah. concerned about. Yeah, definitely. So mentally it's tough. And then spiritually, it can be very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. You get all of these other influences. And I think that's part of what happened here is they were getting religious influences from the people that they from this country, this new people that they didn't do what God said and wipe them all out, you know, so they kind of hit the in between and said, we'll keep some of what they've got. Maybe it's OK. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not OK. Yeah. You know, that that idea of driving the people completely out of the land is so offensive right. to, you know, to our sensitivities. Why would God do that to other people? But we got to remember Again, going back to Genesis chapter 15 with the covenant that was made with Abraham when he said that the iniquity of the Amorites not yet complete. God was merciful to them yeah. for hundreds of years, at least 400. Right. And, uh, but that was his will that they drive them out so that there wouldn't be this potential of compromise. And obviously that's not the case today. Yeah. You know, we're not driving people away. No. But still there's that principle from 2 Corinthians 6 of being careful who you're... Uh, and you're associated. You're with. yoked with. You're yeah, associated right. with. Absolutely, and it's, it's really. I think we all have that challenge because we want to be relevant in the circles that we're in, whether right. it's work or whatever. We want to be seen as. I hate to use the word important, but we want to be seen as relevant in what we do in our jobs, in our home, and sometimes you do make those compromises right. to be in the in crowd. You know that was 
kind of the thing when we were growing up. You wanted to be in the cool with the cool crew. Yeah, you know, so much whatever. pressure. Yeah, there is. There is a whole lot. Well, uh, the second part of verse 17 there in Judges 2 uh, is also shocking when it says they turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments. I, I think that's something very important for us today to realize how quickly things can change. Um, I, I know early on in, in ministry, I used to hear this phrase all the time, we're one generation right. away from apostasy. Yeah, We really got to keep that in mind, yeah. don't we? Of, I, th I think we do, and you wonder, you know, a couple of other things that I wrote down as I was thinking about this is, um, were they being taught the why versus the what? Mm. Were they being taught why God is good or why we are here? Why are we the chosen people? Or were we just, or were the kids and the generations just being taught, in order to please God, you've got to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And there's a difference there. Right. You know, and then when they see a different group pleasing their God doing this, and they don't understand the why, mm. you know, that may make you quickly turn because, you know, you see that, oh, this is more fun, or right. this is more appealing or more satisfying than what God has told us to do because of this, right. because he loved us, because he taken us, has taken us out of this land, you know, out of slavery and given us this land. Mm. So, and, and that's yeah. what they were supposed to be remembering, of right. course, in the Passover and, right. and conveying that to the kids. So we have a golden opportunity for that uh, each, each Lord's Day as we're yeah, partaking absolutely. of the Lord's Supper to, to teach our kids uh, that great redemptive uh, event right. of Christ dying for our sins, but not just the, as you say, not just the what happened there or the traditions that we have, and that's why we're doing the Lord's Supper, but the why. Right, yeah. What is that why? Why do we do what we do? You know, I'm so grateful that we're looking at, we, you know, before we've taken this break for the 40 days of prayer, that we were going back and looking through those fundamentals, those mm. essentials. That's the kind of things we need to be really teaching our kids, mm. and that our kids, when they leave here, should understand that. Understand the why, not so much the what. Right. Well, we are so blessed at the Sylvan Hills Church family to have uh, great Bible class teachers oh, for our children that assist and and, uh, and augment what mm -hmm. is hopefully taking place in the home. Uh, very, very gifted people in, in a lot of areas, but particularly yeah. in teaching. And, and, and that really is a gift to, to be able to go back yeah. to a, a first principles type story and, and right. to help the kids imagine and see in their minds, yeah. you know, God did this for you. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just so neat. I remember growing up, a lot of my teachers in Bible class were classroom teachers also. And I think we've got that same thing here, that we've got a lot of our teachers that also teach as a job. So they know how to engage kids. They right. know how to spark that imagination. They know how to be creative and do those, whether it's a manipulative or something with their hands or drawing or whatever it is, you know, that does create that connection to the why. Right. To those first principles, to those basic stories that they... Right. Can take with them throughout life. Well, obviously you turned out all right. So, uh, <laughs> who were some of these? Still in progress. Still well, work okay. in progress. I guess we all are. But, yeah. but who were some of the influences upon you as? Uh, oh man. As you were being raised up. Yeah. The, uh, of course, there's my immediate family, mom and dad. Um, they were. My dad was a example of service, of uh, <laughs> of quiet service. You know, he was in the background. He was doing things all the time. Uh, for different people. Um, mom, the same way. My grandmother, I remember my picture of her is sitting by her bed in a rocking chair with her Bible open. Mm. And her Bible was just marked up. As she read, she would underline things. You know, so those were, you know, three of the major influences. But then, like I mentioned, the Bible class teachers we had, um, they taught Bible class like it was school. I remember going home. They would grade our <laughs> lessons. You know, and I got a D one time in Bible class for a lesson that I didn't complete. We did not know that when he was yeah. appointed an elder. Uh, now didn't, we're finding out. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. <laughs> uh, but some of those folks, our, our youth minister was, uh, at that time we didn't call him youth ministers. We called him a youth director. Yeah. And uh, he was probably in his 60s or 70s. Mm. And, uh, but just took this group of teenagers and we did different things and just loved on us and, and provided opportunities for us and encouraged us. And then just so many others that I can just, you know, go through names and faces that are just very, very close and great relationships and great memories of growing up. But people took time to pour into us. Right. 
And I think that's the thing that, you know, here at Sylvan Hills, we need to do that same thing. We need to find those opportunities to pour into our kids and pour into that next generation. A, a verse I came across as I was looking through this, and we can, uh, oh man, I lost it. Psalm 71, 18, since my... Is even when I'm old and gray, Greg, that's us now, right? Uh, uh, don't forsake me, my Lord, till I declare your power to the next generation, mm -hmm. your mighty acts to all who are to come. There it is. So there's like, okay, we still got a job. Even if we're old and gray, you know, we've got a job. Another thing I love about this congregation is that we are multi-generational. Right. And we've got the Minas and we've got all these other people that are just willing to pour into that next generation. I love seeing the encouragers in LTC, how they would pour into and encourage our kids in LTC as they went through that program right. and everything. It, it was just amazing to see and people that you never knew. You, they're not those folks that are out front, you know, that are up front doing things, but they're grabbing one of those kids and some of them want the same kid each year after year after year right? because yeah. they can make those connections. Well, that's... Uh... Uh, that is so important, especially as we think about applying the message of Judges to us today. I think mm -hmm. for me, uh, I, uh, uh, as I think back to my childhood in particular, it was certainly uh, my dad's mom, my grandmother mm -hmm. that we called Granny. And uh, when she passed away, one of the things that I received from her was, was her Bible, her mm -hmm. big old yeah. thick black oh, yeah. heavy King James King Bible. James, yep. And so I, you know, set it somewhere safe and all that. And then the first congregation that I worked with was King James only. Mm. I'm like, what am I, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I took her Bible. Yeah. And I actually did my preaching and teaching from her okay. Bible. Oh, nice. In my first yeah. work. And so uh, she was definitely an influence. And then uh, an aunt there uh, as well. Uh, my dad's uh, sister and then my mom. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you wonder how much did they know at the time, how big of an influence they were. And... You know, yeah. really had no idea how things would no. turn out because no. they were pouring into so yeah. many. And then I think about the, the men that taught our Sunday afternoon classes. Mm -hmm. We used to have Sunday afternoon uh, Timothy classes. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so those yeah. people were pouring into kids, not knowing how they were going to turn out. Right. And then God raised up yeah. another Absolutely. generation. And that's, that's the thing going back to chapter 2. We've got verse 10, when there arose a generation that didn't know the Lord, but then in verse 16, the Lord raised up judges. So mm -hmm. our prayer has got to be, Lord, raise up a new Absolutely. generation that knows Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. And it draws closer than we did as a generation. Yeah. You know, and where that focus is, I'll go back to that why versus the what. You know, for my generation, I think for our generation, a lot of it was the what mm -hmm. as opposed to the why and so, really getting that why in our hearts. Absolutely. So... Uh, what would be your guidance? I mean, that's, that's part of what we look for in appointing a shepherd is that they've uh, done well with their household. What, uh, just off the top of your head, what would be wow. maybe a suggestion that you would give to parents today to, to really encourage this intentional effort and just, just offer us a word of encouragement as we begin to, to wrap this up? You know, I think as parents, we have to control the distraction. Hmm. We, we have that ability in our household to control some of the distractions. And we make choices. Mm. Um, That's not always fun. It's not, oh my yeah. lands, no it's not. Uh, some of the choices we made were just limiting extracurricular activities. Mm. Uh, so we didn't feel like as a family we were going chasing things, mm. you know, all the time and just so busy. We made choices to spend time on the lake on Saturdays with friends as opposed to playing soccer or you know, whatever it may be. And everybody has their own thing. I, I get it, and I, I know that. But I think as parents, we have to make those choices to limit distractions yeah. that our kids, because they can't make the choices. Right. Everything looks good to the kids. Right. They don't want you know, to be left behind. Right, right. And we don't want to be that parent that leaves them behind either, you know, yeah. really. But we have to, we owe it to our kids to, I think, be that person that filters Right. Some, be that filter. Maybe that's the best way to, mm. to put it, is filter those distractions for our kids. That's part of bringing them up yeah. in the discipline and admonition of the Absolutely. Lord. Absolutely. When I think about what you said there about uh, on the lake with other people, I know who some of those people were yeah. that you had. Oh, absolutely. So it's, it's not just sitting at home. 
it's it's putting our kids mm -hmm. around other people right. that they can see their faith, see how they right. are separate from church. Yeah, that's yeah. some really good encouragement. Yeah, I Thanks. appreciate you offering that. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, so much in Judges is negative, but the positive is that God can raise up another mm -hmm. generation that we can impact uh, the moral climate of our families, of our churches, and our communities when we're walking in obedience with the Lord. So thank you again, Tony, for oh, joining us. Appreciate and uh, next week will be Ruth.